Okay, this final session, I really wanted just to use this to draw together some of the sort of the final themes, ideas, uh, key points, but perhaps also some of the things that haven't been raised over the conference so far. I'm going to hand over to Dorothy Zinberg in a moment, but I just wanted to remind our panel um, and perhaps even to introduce a slightly harsher rule. I'm going to ask you all just to speak for five minutes, just literally, I know very harsh. The five minutes, what were the key points that you thought were most interesting? Um, are there any questions that haven't been raised you think should have been raised? And in particular, any points um, sort of taking us forward, anything that's really helped us, you think, to progress thinking on these, on these topics? Um, we've got six speakers, so if we go through those five minutes each, that's about half an hour, and I then want to turn it over to the floor. So what I'm going to be doing at the end of all this is trying to put together some of the key points into a sort of quite policy-focused report. Now, I'd like you to send me any comments after this. I'm going to put my email address, address um, up later, hopefully. But again, if you can give me as much feedback now as possible on what you think should be in any report that we produce, then that would be very helpful. So as I say, half an hour we're going to have, hopefully, for our, for our panel here, and then I'm going to turn it over to all of you. So just to introduce our, introduce our final chair, I'm really delighted to have her here. She's been a great friend of the OII since we were established. Uh, Dorothy Shaw Zinberg, she's a lecturer at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. She's had a fantastically um, renowned career in international science and technology policy. Again, she's one of these fantastic academics who has actively served and worked in the policy sphere as well as actually producing great academic research. Um, so, Dorothy, I'm going to hand over to you. You can be as ruthless as you like with them all. Here we go. Thank you very much. Uh, I think my role has been reduced to timekeeper. And uh, <laughs> for those who know me, I am fairly ruthless. So it's five minutes, everybody understands the ground rules, and at the end of four minutes, I'll stand up and scream. Uh, I did want to say before all of these people began to offer what I'm sure are going to be extremely interesting insights, is that I finally understand now what adult education is all about because this is not my field, and I have come away from this intense course uh, in a field in which I'm no expert, in fact, I would say totally uninformed, with my mind just filled with ideas and challenges of where the next generation of research ideas have to come from, have to be carried out, and what the public policy implications are. It's quite a challenge, and I'm delighted this is a group that's going to be able to get us closer to fulfilling those goals. So with that, let's go uh, in the order. We're going. Uh, Richard Allen will speak first. Where is Richard Allen? Oh, good. <laughs> and then we will go according to your programs. Everybody's biography, I believe, is in the back, but people can introduce themselves if it is not. Yes. <clears throat> Thanks very much. Um, I, f I found it. A f I had to nip off for a bit yesterday, but I found uh, all the time I've been here uh, fascinating. So some things haven't changed in terms of the debate over the last few years. I followed it as a politician over uh, the best part of a decade, the debate about the Internet, its social benefits, and the disbenefits of the Internet. Uh, certainly the bit that hasn't changed is that there are still very different views about what constitutes acceptable content and what doesn't constitute acceptable content. I think that's a given. Um, but within that, I think the debate has moved on. I've learned that over the last uh, uh, two days. Firstly, there are different possible responses. The first is to maintain the old idea of the Internet as a mere conduit. The Internet is simply something that connects computers together, and all the responsibility and all the liability falls on the people who control the computers at each end of that connection, uh, and there is no responsibility on the net itself. The net has no content. It's essentially that uh, form of understanding regulation, and that would point to us putting in place filtering technologies and changing the criminal law for possession of things, uh, rather than worrying about um, how they actually uh, got there. The fact that some response are necessary for that, I think, is driven by the fact that the Internet has uh, driven down the costs of accessing things and made it easier. Uh, so there are things. I mean, child pornography always existed, uh, violent pornography always existed, but it is available to a lot more people a lot more cheaply, and that causes concern for politicians uh, to which they feel the need to respond. Uh, and that's the other key message I want to get across. The politicians are coming. Don't think uh, that they're going to walk away from it and you can say to them, oh, nothing's possible and they're, they're just going to drop this. Uh, so things are being changed uh, on that basis. Uh, combined with this idea of of uh, the user's com computers, we can have more strenuous efforts to disconnect those who uh, abuse the internet, who behave inappropriately, however we define appropriately, and that again is contentious. We can disconnect people from the net. 
Uh, and so we have to have a debate about whether being connected to the net is a right or something that you can only have if you fulfill certain terms and conditions. And that's certainly the UK model. The UK model of the industry has been to disconnect people who misbehave, uh, starting with people who uh, misbehave in terms of content, but actually now moving on to disconnecting people who run botnets, I found out when my ISP contacted me to say my internet co connection would be terminated if I didn't clean up the viruses I had uh, that meant I was sending out spam email. So there is a, a response, certainly, that is developing, an industry response that says disconnect people who don't behave. And I think uh, Lillian's comments were kind of along those lines, saying you need to earn the right uh, to be connected. Uh, the, it's also the eBay model. eBay allows you to do certain things within the auction site, but not other things. Now, of course, people who want to do things uh, inappropriate go elsewhere, but what we do end up with is, is signposting. Uh, if you go onto the mainstream net, you know it's okay. Just like if you go into the centre of London, you know it's okay. If you go to Soho in London, it's different. And if you went to certain other places on the net, it would be different. But the mainstream bits, you have to fulfil certain responsibilities to be connected into that. And that's something I can see uh, developing. The final area, which I think is or possible response, which is much more contentious, and Jonathan Zittrain uh, started us off with this in his keynote, keynote is really about re-engineering the net itself uh, to change the way uh, it works and make it a filtering net, I think, in some sense. And there are different ways of doing that. There is a, an industry response. Things like BT CleanFeed is an industry response to that. Uh, the Australian example, I think we've heard, is an industry response, uh, usually driven by the threat of regulation, uh, or there's the IETF-type response where it's engineered uh, for the whole Internet. So I think all of these are possible. They're all going to have to be judged in terms of their practicality, their affordability, and their beneficial uh, impact on the community. But don't think that the politicians are going to go away, and don't think they're not coming. Lillian, final point, Lillian uh, talked about possible regulation at the EU level. The I-2010 plan for Europe says... During 2006, the Commission will propose a strategy for a secure information society to combine and update the instruments available, including raising awareness of the need for self-protection, vigilance and monitoring of threats, rapid and effective response to system attacks and system failures. It's happening. The politicians are coming. Uh, the community needs to have sensible responses to that. Uh, otherwise, we're going to end up with bad legislation as we have done before. I think it's difficult with the um, diversity of issues that have been discussed in the last couple of days to really try and encapsulate that in any coherent way. So I'm just going to make some pretty high-level observations about um, what, what I think the issues are and the challenges and perhaps some of the solutions. I mean, we've had a discussion about, you know, what is an effective governance model for the internet, uh, and yet we're dealing with a medium which by its nature resists governance. It's been engineered to route around any form of regulation just as it has around any form of um, technological failure. So that I think there's a fundamental tension between the disruptive nature of the medium which is its strength and its power and everything that we love about the internet versus the fact that it is nevertheless a mainstream medium and b being mainstream involves children who have needs and need to be protected. I'm reminded of a few years ago, back in 1998, I think it was, Andre Wright and I served on a ministerial task force on the question of protecting children on the internet. And one of the uh, members of the committee, um, who had come from a very, um, I think, narrow technical background and had a great technical understanding of the internet, said, we should just concede and tell people what, how it is that the internet was designed as a sort of academic and research and military sort of function. And we should just say that it's a place that is not, not fit for children. So just get over it. Tell them that it's just it's a place they shouldn't be. And I think at that, even by 1998, we realised just how patently wrong that view was. And yet, I mean, that really does confront us with what is the um, challenge here, is that you've got something that isn't like television. It's not manageable within a jurisdiction. And I think, therefore, that the challenge for governments is that now that it's become mainstream, clearly there are constituents that have got real issues with some of the stuff that they're experiencing on that. And as Richard said, that, that drives a political response. Politicians are programmed to respond to community issues, particularly when they arrive in the form of, you know, um, badly spelled um, handwritten letters that um, say, you know, my children's been molested on the internet and what are you doing about this? So I think, you know, the experience in Australia is not that the politicians are coming. They've well and truly been there. 
<laughs> and I think that the response that we've developed is really one that's been trying to preserve the essential elements, the, the freedoms that we want to keep in the internet, but at the same time simultaneously address what are some of the uh, public policy and community safety issues. Um, in terms of its future potential, I mean, it's a tremendously empowering medium, and the fact that we had Stephen Coleman as a professor of e-democracy, I mean, who would have thought a few years ago that there could be a chair in e-democracy? And yet here we have someone who's specialising in and uh, advising governments on how we engage what is a disengaged public from the political process using this medium which is going to become more and more ubiquitous. So I think that, you know, the, we observe that politicians are both excited and also hugely threatened by the internet. They're excited because it provides an unprecedented way for them to fulfil their charter and to um, hear from the people that they purport to represent. And yet they know that for the first time they're confronting something which is much bigger than them that they can't control as they could control the media. And, I mean, it's truly transformative in societies which are repressive and, um, and um, not used to this idea of um, uh, free speech. What does the internet look like in the future? Well, obviously, we're, we've now looked at, we're looking at convergence devices. Um, I think we think about it as an information cloud where you'll be, it'll just be ubiquitous wherever you are. It'll be embedded in devices and clothing and perhaps even neural implants. And so the concept of trying to regulate a medium of that nature is uh, almost like saying, how do you regulate a cloud? Um, it's, it's a difficult issue. And I think the other thing is that, of course, as humanity, we've always managed to uh, ultimately adapt to technology. But uh, as ever, this is a case where we've already got technologies that are, it's like putting um, learner drivers into high-powered racing cars. That's essentially where we're at now, is that they're, they're in charge of very powerful machinery and yet um, we still don't have the skills as users by and large to control it. And I think that hopefully we're not going to have too many road wrecks before we actually manage to get in, in control of this medium. But overall my view is that, that we will survive it. I think this is the most empowering technology that's ever occurred probably in the history of man, mankind. That's a big call but I can't think of any precedent that, that surpasses this. And I think that the overwhelming power of the medium is uh, certainly for the good. Thank you. Australian National University. Uh, I've got five uh, main comments to make <coughs> and a couple of concluding remarks. Uh, the first relates to priorities and I ask the question what matters most? Hands-on child abuse or possession of images? Content that glorifies terrorism or communications in furtherance of real-time terrorist conspiracies? Hate speech or racially motivated violence? I ask the question, to what extent are we concentrating our limited state resources on soft targets at the expense of more harmful behavior? Now, it may well be that the best pathway to the interdiction of physical harm begins with the interdiction of representations, but possibly not. One should strive for carefully developed policies and not just quick runs on the board. My second observation relates to overreaction and unintended consequences or as uh, one would say around here, burning the house to roast the pig. <laughs> the political imperative of being seen to be doing something in a time of crisis, uh, we can all accept and understand. But uh, still we see that zealous advocates of liberty or repression may not foresee the consequences, the logical consequences of the, the policies that, uh, uh, that they would advocate. Uh, we saw uh, right here how uh, Jonathan Zittrain uh, uh, had a confrontation with the local systems administrator uh, and his access was barred to uh, a legitimate piece of legal research. Um, that's, uh, that says it all in a nutshell. But once again, uh, one should model the consequences of one's proposals or intended actions or face the prospect of either ferocious opposition on the one hand or ridicule on the other. Carefully develop policies once again. Uh, the next issue relates to civil remedies. Uh, we heard some discussions about uh, product liability, suing the writers of insecure software. There are other dimensions, however, that uh, I think uh, are worth discussion. Um, suing schools for creating uh, hazardous uh, electronic environments uh, for their students uh, was something that was raised in one of the uh, workshops. 
um, suing employers for uh, the uh, uh, exploitation of their information systems for defamation, sexual or racial harassment is another. Uh, downstream liability for damage resulting from the careless administration of an inst institution's information systems is something else that, uh, uh, that uh, might merit attention. And there's, there's tension here uh, between uh, the employee's right to privacy uh, and the employer's obligations and duties of care to other employees uh, and, uh, and uh, downstream interests. So how to balance an employee's right to privacy with the duty of care owed to other employees, shareholders, and third parties is an interesting issue that I think uh, we could have spent a bit more time on. Uh, the next issue relates to coordination and accountability in an environment of regulatory pluralism. We have states, we have private actors, both commercial NGOs, individual citizens, and so on, um, a, a very rich um, uh, uh, array of, of, of uh, institutions, all of which can participate in one manner or another in the governance of cyberspace. Um, in, in jurisdictions where the state is uh, uh, central, uh, uh, this might have a, uh, uh, an effect of, uh, of chilling uh, constructive citizen activity. Uh, I, I was taken by the discussion of the New Zealand situation where the withdrawal of the state from many areas of, of, uh, of regulatory activity has given rise to a, a flourishing civil society. Uh, and uh, our, our sponsor, NetSafe, I think, is a, a wonderful illustration of, of, uh, of how uh, 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 NGOs can, uh, uh, can fill a vacuum, perhaps more constructively uh, than the state could uh, if it uh, uh, were to maintain uh, a, uh, a state-centric uh, dominance of, of, of public policy. And we see that, uh, that NetSafe is uh, an instrumental, uh, essential partner of, uh, of law enforcement and education authorities among uh, uh, just two examples. Um, there are well-meaning individuals uh, and others who are perhaps less well-meaning. Uh, one wonders if... Um, uh, rampant bounty hunting in cyberspace is a very good idea. Uh, we can uh, imagine examples of entrapment where um, uh, would-be uh, cyber cops uh, create crime, contaminate investigations. Um, this is arguably inappropriate. On the other hand, at one of the uh, panels, it was suggested that uh, there be a legitimate uh, right of self-defense in some circumstances where... Uh, uh, state, uh, state uh, law enforcement capacity is unable to assist. Now, the ideal regulatory configuration uh, will vary with the, the, the problem in question and with the capacity of participating institutions within a particular uh, jurisdiction. There is no one-size-fits-all recipe, uh, and, and uh, you can be sure that uh, the specific regulatory mix appropriate to the interdiction of spam or uh, malware or harmful content will vary from place to place depending on those institutions. Time. Oh, just, just to, uh, to, to, to tie up uh, then, I, I'm going to enter a plea for evidence-based policy. We had a debate relating to uh, the virtual child pornography defense, um, uh, uh, making convictions impossible, and yet we were given evidence that suggested there are a lot of people in prison in the United States despite that. Uh, it seems to me that there should be evidence brought to bear. Where is the data is a question that should be raised and, uh, and, and policy should be based on evidence. Um, that concludes my observations. I think uh, one other thing that might have been accorded some attention, issues in, in criminal procedure relating to search and seizure of electronic evidence, uh, spyware as an investigative tool, and remote cross-border searches, and the issues of sovereignty that uh, that... that uh, that that would um, uh, raise, but uh, I've run out of time. Thank you very much. Bill, I think you're next because uh, Justice Richard is going next. Yes. Okay. So should I take Richard's thunder? <laughs> <laughs> no, we had Richard Allen who took his place. Oh, oh, okay. I want everyone to know this is a thankless role. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. I usually do that. Sorry, I screwed up the screen. Okay, uh, five minutes. I'll take five, try to, five themes and an overarching observation, which is 
uh, I started out as a political scientist. I so this today brought me back to graduate school when I was thinking, most people think of policy making from a rational comprehensive perspective. We all want to do rational comprehensive policy. But what do we really do? Policy makers muddle through. We muddle through and parents muddle through. And in, in many respects, we have to go back to muddling through. And, and that'll be the general theme. But the five basic themes that I think cut through this session were times have changed. This is a very interesting. Today, I, to put down my notes, it said defeating terror may be mean giving up rights, MI5. The he head of MI5 wrote a confidential memo, which she allowed to be on the web. <laughs> 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 and, this, uh, and which uh, said that we're going to have to give up civil liberties to protect ourselves from terrorism. But anyway, they, uh, so times have changed. The context has changed. But, uh, but we have to really look at history carefully because, uh, again, early history was simpler. The Internet was, a, uh, it was in universities and so forth. But in the early history of the Internet, before the PC, there was hate mail. There was all, all of the things that are happening now were happening. But students got expelled from schools, et cetera, et cetera. So there was regulation. There were, were offenses. It's, it wasn't, don't romanticize the history, but it's, times have clearly changed. And in terms of time, re, I, remind me of Mark Twain's story the danger of lying in bed, where he, he wrote a, an essay about uh, train, uh, the hazards of train travel, where he looked at statistics on how many people were getting killed by train accidents. But then he started looking at where people are getting killed and all over, all over the place, and he basically concluded that the most dangerous place in the world to be is in bed. <laughs> and if the, so he recommended the best place to do is to ride the train all your life and don't lie down in bed. <laughs> and you're like, but still, that doesn't negate the importance of safety on trains. And, uh, and trains, uh, safety of train travel is, is continuing to be a huge issue. And we keep trying to make trains safer. It doesn't mean that we don't try to make the internet safer, even though it's a relatively safe place to be. A second theme is the politics of language. This has been a fascinating discussion. It came up today, what, what, uh, what do you guys mean by safety? And what do you mean by security? And what, uh, so the, uh, the politics of language and the politics of research goes into this. Even doing a conference or research in this area plays a political role. Uh, and you, we're constantly thinking how we can not sort of bias the politics of public policy by the concept, the title of a conference or the title of a research project or the findings. A third theme is what is the right focus? And this, uh, Jonathan opened this up in the, in the preliminary. Is it educating users? Is it getting more limited PCs, appliances? Is it more, uh, uh, a more intelligent internet? Uh, changing the culture, government regulation, more harmonization, more centralization of control over users and virus updates, et cetera. What's the right focus? Well, the answer to that is to some, well, we don't know and there's no perfect one, so do nothing. Uh, the American response is usually, if you don't know what to do, you do everything. <laughs> and I think muddling through is probably the approach. I think people are moving on all of those fronts, and I don't think people are going to wait for the perfect answer. The other theme is uh, clearly related to that is um, a theme about uh, consumers and users. Um, Consumers are much more varied. They're just not a user or a consumer. They're informed, they're old and young, and uh, there are people that are closest to the system, those who study the internet carefully and computer scientists are very concerned over privacy, security, other issues like that. And people most alienated from the system who know least about it are the most concerned. It's the typical user is probably most uh, least concerned because they seem how can, I can't hardly com turn my computer on, how can anybody use this as a surveillance technology, et cetera. So there's a, um, there are very different attitudes. But remember, the public is generally, and I'm sorry to say, but anyway, the public is generally anti-democratic and, and not concerned about privacy. Uh, the public gives away privacy all the time for convenience, for health, for safety, and so forth. Uh, the, uh, the public supports, even in the U.S., the public supports the idea of the First Amendment, but they will not allow uh, freedom of expression if they are asked specifically the famous study about whether a communist could give a presentation at a high school, and no. <laughs> it would be, 
so that you cannot rely on public opinion to make, you have to rely on an informed, educated uh, elite to protect uh, fundamental values and balance fundamental values. And I think it's, um, I think that's an issue we should debate more. Um, the, finally, the complexity and uncertainty surrounding these issues. I mean, the one big message of all this conference was that we have many players. We have multiple jurisdictions. Even in Belfast, he was talk the police officer was talking about how there are 40 jurisdictions of police that are dealing with issues in Belfast. And that, and that doesn't go global. Uh, the number of ICTs we're talking about and the interaction across ICTs, not just the internet, but then the mobile phone married to the internet and so forth, that the, uh, and the different design fixes that are being discussed. Multiple policy responses, many, many issues, uh, from security to trust to privacy uh, to an anonymity and on. There's a laundry list of issues that are affected by any technical change, and all of them emotive. Uh, which cut very deeply for many people, making this a very, very complex and difficult, uh, whether it's a swamp or a, a rich area for research. I think it's a rich area for research, but it means it's highly complex, high uncertainty, and all of the responses have unpredictable consequences. Uh, many examples of public policy having exactly the opposite impact than they were intended to have. So what we have is, is muddling through where we know people are going to be taking actions on all of these various fronts with unpredictable consequences. And it means that we really have to, there's really, I, it just reinforced my view that we have to do research, we have to talk about these areas because we have to monitor what kinds of things are going on, have good debate about uh, the potential consequences, and we haven't done enough in this area. I think uh, too many researchers have stayed out of this area because it is so emotive and so uh, charged and, and uh, fearing that it's a swamp that they'll never get out of. But I think that, uh, anyway, but that said, and I, I was reminded by, is, are we over? Um, <laughs> director, you should have a like. <laughs> but uh, one, a colleague of mine once said we should have signs. It was everybody saying the liability of ISPs, the liability of, and luckily professors usually get away with no liability at all. We, but we, we thought we should have signs that as you go into a university, there should be like a brain and crossbones. <laughs> and saying, be careful, there are many ideas here that could be dangerous. <laughs> Do not, you know, use them with caution. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm Liz Butterfield from NetSafe, the Internet Safety Group of New Zealand. Um, I think if most people leave this room doing what Dorothy said she wants to do, which is go out and generate research about these fascinating topics, then I think this conference has achieved precisely what we were after. Um, when I look back in 98 and 99, um, many of you were working on this long before that, but for me, I was knocking on the doors at universities and volunteering to just meet with um, post-grad student groups to beg them to look at internet topics in their fields of psychology, sociology, social psychology, um, to take up what I found were not only fascinating areas, but areas where there was such great benefit if they actually generated the work to help us know what is going on and what the social impact of these technologies actually is. Um, I, I just have a couple observations about some of the things I've seen. Um, when, back when we started this in New Zealand, we were talking about internet safety. We've now moved to um, talking about and talking about being safe on the internet and behaving safely. We're now moving to safe and responsible use as a term. And I think, but incumbent on those who say this is what we're after, safe and responsible use, it becomes clear we have to define exactly what those responsibilities are for people and also how we can get them the information that they need and the knowledge that they need to actually carry out those responsibilities. 
And that goes to both basic computer security education, but also for parents, for security professionals in the field, for government agencies. It's, um, I think there's a lot to be done in defining that word about what is responsible use. Um, we've also moved from internet safety as the term for what we're here discussing to cyber safety and including things like mobile phones, iPods, memory sticks, um, all different kinds of devices that we're seeing on the scene now. And with this conference, we moved to cyber safety and security. And I think there was some kind of, and certainly we've seen this in New Zealand too, the resistance to put those two things together. And I think what we're then headed towards is probably back to just cyber safety by itself with an understanding that security is, of course, a part of cyber safety. And um, I'm so pleased to see this evolution because I think um, it has not helped having these fields quite separate in different silos. Um, we've seen sort of the, um, the emphasis moving from awareness raising to education. And I wanted to just touch on that point because I think, what do we mean, what's the difference there? And to me, what education is, is helping people fully integrate that knowledge into their lives, into the way they live their lives, into what they do, um, into how they think and feel about things. That's the profound effect of education versus awareness raising. And I totally agree with the very large number of people in sessions that I've heard raise that issue at this conference. And I think that is what we have to do. And in addition, when we've raised the awareness and then we actually get people to integrate it through education into their lives, we then have to have the networks ready when a response is needed or treatment is needed so that then people can move on from whatever the, the issue was in a very positive way. So that is part of what we're working on, whether it's response in computer security, where does a person take their compromised computer once they're finally aware that in fact they are compromised, but also for a parent, where do they take their child when they realize that their child has been, excuse me, groomed and abused. So that I think is, Part of what we're doing is setting up the networks to support people um, once we have this understanding and once they are, this knowledge is integrated. Uh, um, just want to finish up with the importance of the cross-sector communication. There's an ex expression in Māori in New Zealand that says, your basket, my basket, together we nourish the people. And I think that's what this is about, the collaboration across sectors. So I'll leave you um, with a New Zealand uh, way of saying goodbye, which is na mihi aroha kia koutou, uh, here i rā ka kite ano, which means blessings of love on you all. We'll see you soon. <laughs>my apologies to everyone. Vicki, never again. That's not the role I want. <laughs> uh, let me say, we now have an hour in which people can make comments, address questions to our aborted group of speakers here. And if I make what may make one observation, I've noticed in the few days I've been here that women's voices do not carry as well as men's. And so I'm going to ask the women to make, to concentrate on speaking up because I've seen a lot of the men who do lose background hearing before women do going like this. So if we could just bring those two groups together, uh, I think it's going to help the people who are taking notes and writing up the conference. So uh, if you would be sure, give us your name, speak up, and make your point, and then add if there's anyone on the panel to whom you would like to address your comments or a question. Summary that there's nothing left. Yes, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh, Philip Nigel, Urim, and uh, after this event, one of my tasks will be to try and digest some of the messages uh, to try and ensure that when the politicians do become active, the results are less disastrous than they might otherwise be. But I got three points which I didn't uh, address.
additional uh, that I wanted to raise. One of them, when we're looking at education, is the need to educate the suppliers that they really are dealing with the real world, and that means products and services fit for use by human beings, that human beings will pay for, and to bring in the laws of economics. <coughs> the second one is in that context, perhaps the need for awards and rewards for products and services that are intelligible, and maybe rather like the British Lottery, to have a rollover award. If there's nothing that's fit this year, you roll it forward. And I'd like to run a sweepstake on how many years we have to wait before there are things that are intelligible. And the final one for the British government, that if they really are serious about e-government and modernizing government, and having websites that really are used by the bulk of the population to find out about what they're up to, they should hire the webmaster of the Tamil Tigers.
uh, murdered his, uh, his girlfriend, uh, Jane Longhurst, uh, cut up her body into pieces and, and, and stored it and uh, regularly uh, went to see the cut up pieces and both before and after was uh, periodically accessing extreme adult pornography websites. Now, we don't know whether there was a connection and, and we can say, well, that one case doesn't prove anything. You know, let's wait for 10 or 20 cases. But public policymakers are, are not in that business where they can wait for the evidence to be conclusive. So I wish all you academics, you know, loads of fun and loads of funding. And uh, I'm happy to help you as much as possible with your research. But in this area, uh, research uh, can be exceptionally difficult. Could you wait one second? Because I'd love to Bill, respond as an American. You don't have to speak as an American. But <laughs> do that because this has been a repeated theme of yours of, of, of where does the United States fit in to assuming more responsibility because it's generating what you see as the largest percentage of what's giving us some of these problems. So, Bill, you may have another point to make. <coughs> okay. Just uh, the. Um, in some areas, there is evidence that uh, things are not necessarily uh, getting worse. They're actually, uh, there's some progress in a variety of areas. Uh, let me, an example would be spam. Uh, interestingly, the Oxford Internet Survey suggests that people are less concerned with spam now than they were two years ago. And that uh, almost most people who are users of the Internet uh, who are concerned are doing something about it. They have spam filters and so forth. And again, they're not perfect, but they're getting better and better. And people are, have uh, artificial intelligence to help them make decisions of what sites to look at and which ones to delete. And uh, So filtering is getting better. And so uh, vir problems with viruses and, and spam are uh, actually uh, being addressed by a variety of actors, and things are being done. So that, uh, And I would imagine in the sort of uh, Sonia's point in terms of we have to uh, keep ahead of the curve because new technologies keep creating new risks, but people learn fast and, and the internet is a way of communicating quickly among a lot of people and schools are, you know, there's a lot of communication going on. And certainly, and there's probably been no greater area of research in universities and in the media, in the media studies than violence and, and uh, kids and uh, the impact of, uh, of violent programming on uh, children and uh, aggressiveness of children. And uh, much of it is, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a good deal of controversy about that, but it generally support, there is a good deal of evidence to suggest uh, some concern over uh, violent programming and uh, aggressiveness for some children in some contexts. And so there's a huge amount of academic research that speaks to some of this. One of the responses of the UK to their inability to control content in the States has been to start the development of the national internet for the UK. BT Clean Feed is the start, the first step towards developing a national internet where if you log into the internet in the UK, you will get different material from if you log in elsewhere. And it's something obviously which countries like China and Saudi Arabia uh, already explicitly do, which we normally disapprove of. I'm, I'm going to think whether there's going to be a trend towards nationalizing <coughs> the internet when we've always assumed, or I think the internet community assumed the opposite, that it's actually this thing where you know, it, it liberalizes and opens up all these repressive regimes. Actually, uh, liberal Western regimes, because of this frustration of policymakers that not being able to control what's going on elsewhere and their inability to enforce their own legislation, are starting to require this nationalization. And I would put money on the trend in the UK being in that direction. BT Clean Feed has now uh, raised questions in politicians' mind where Lord Sainsbury is uh, looking at the animal rights activists who are attacking people's homes and committing pseudo-terrorist acts, whatever one thinks about that, and saying, if they can stop child pornography, why can't they stop animal rights activist sites? When violent pornography is made illegal, presumably the Internet Watch Foundation will uh, monitor it, that will be added to the list. When terrorism glorification becomes illegal, that will be added to the list. And the technological barriers, because the switching and everything is so much better now, are being reduced all the time. So, so the potential is there for national governments to say, we want a national internet. Uh, uh, whatever people think about that, that's one possible direction and completely, I think, opposite to the way people have always assumed the internet was going to go. And I leave it as a question. 
Um, but I would put money on it going national. Yeah. The only problem with that would, of course, be if the BT Clean Fleet was a monopoly. If the only way you could connect in the UK to the internet would be BT Clean Fleet. But what they're doing, uh, uh, you're right, you can have international calls. What they're effectively doing, and this is the Australian example of sense as well, is they're saying, uh, the government is saying, if the industry does not adopt BT Clean Fleet, if it doesn't become universal, then we will act. In Australia, they have reserve powers on the statute book already, don't they, to act. And I, just, I can see government saying, we're putting stuff on the statute book, and either the industry entirely accepts our filtering and our standards, or we're going to impose it by law. Although, having said that, and I pointed it out in the presentation, the filtering is still optional in Australia, and it's, it, it provided that families feel that they've got some protections there to complement parental supervision, then um, we're confident those reserve powers won't cut in, but then who's to predict what a future government might do and, uh, in this time of uh, terrorism? I think there are real questions to be asked about how much <coughs> things can evolve in unpredictable direction. Yes. Um, going back to the... Would you say your name? Sorry, it's Stephen Coleman from the Lots of Internet Um Going back to the question of values that are at stake here, I'm, I'm a little uneasy about the implication of something Bill said, not, not the substance of what he said, which I think is right, which is that the public tends very often to have rather undemocratic um, thoughts about policy. But I think that there are kind of two implications of that that worry me. One of them is that regulation then becomes essentially a process of taming public values. And I'm very worried about that notion of regulation. It seems to me that what regulation has to do <coughs> is to be conceived as an ethical enterprise. It is an enterprise which is essentially about what people are allowed to cross into the boundaries of that private space, which is going to produce a lot of differentiated answers. Some people will accept some things, some will accept others, some will accept things for themselves and not for others, some will accept things for their children, not, not other people's children. And it seems to me that the way to negotiate that has to be through some channel of accountability that gives recognition to the nature of that differentiation of response within the public and gives some kind of respect to that differentiation of response. Otherwise, I think you end up with a regulatory regime that is essentially about um, a permanent process of educating the public and which becomes quite repressive if by intention. Not, not by consequence. My second point is just about something I think is touching on this internal implication, and that is the notion that mediation is something that we occasionally enter into through technology. And I think one of the things that underlies a lot of this debate is this notion that there are some things that are mediated, there are others that are not, and it's the mediated ones you need to worry about. And I think if you approach this whole discussion from a theoretical perspective, that everything we do and say that is meaningful is mediated, then actually that changes the nature of the regulatory debate because it is not a debate that is primarily about the systematic um, consequences of technology, but it is about the systematic consequences of culture, which is which, which, which presents a whole set of different policy and ethical um, considerations. Uh, it's so helpfully striking to me to see so many elements of this debate harken back to where I think the debate in the United States stood in 1995 and somehow faded away without resolution. People just kind of moved on to other debates. And by that I particularly mean the centrality of protecting children online and the centrality of the issue of pornography. Uh, while in the United States there are occasionally rumblings uh, among red state legislators in the Congress, even they don't appear to take it seriously enough to actually want to pass anything. And the laws that they do pass, I think they know, will in fact be struck down as unconstitutional, and that's just fine by them. Um, what I hear among us is agreement that simply throwing up our hands and saying, that, hey, the internet just isn't for kids, 
is not a satisfying answer. You can move one click over from that and say, well, we want to create zones that are safe for kids. We want to create technologies and attitudes and laws that facilitate parents putting their kids in front of a machine, hitting a few settings and making it so that they won't hit materials that before the internet came about, they would really not have exposed themselves to uh, very easily out in the real world. And I don't know, even from the libertarian camps, that there's any real objection at the end of the day to really trying to create those zones and even mandating actions by people putting up controversial material to help demarcate it as such and thereby enable the zones to <coughs> know whether to include it. <coughs> the next click over, which starts to get to clean feed and China and Saudi Arabia is, well, do we want the entire zone of the internet to respect certain boundaries? And I think there are some views that say, yeah, that's the way it should be, and others not. There's probably an understanding you wouldn't get worldwide agreement on that, which is why you then have to have nations on their destination side try to create a wall and then seriously ask themselves, how far are we willing to go to plug the holes in that wall? We just want it to basically be guardrails along the highway so that if somebody, as I did moments after I was blocked, VPN'd over to the United States, which all of you can do too, I'll show you how, <laughs> and you know, all right, we have to block that too. And you see in China and Saudi Arabia actually different levels of intensity as to how much they really care about that. Saudi Arabia, if you want to get around it, you can get around it. China, a little harder, but still obviously not perfect. But I think the final click over, the thing that really puts us to the question of what kind of internet we want, is whether we can suborn the open and private movement of bits between two willing parties. That's different from a website open to the world at large broadcasting certain stuff where the government can come in wearing a consumer's hat and say, wait a minute, you just handed me stuff that I don't approve of. But as we move to a more distributed peer-to-peer -peer world and all the talk of filtering websites and keeping track of URLs, if not 1995, is so 2003, <laughs> um, we really are going to be asked whether we want a network where willing people can exchange bits and not have third parties peer inside. And I even heard John, during the first panel uh, on Thursday, say that he was willing to say encryption is okay. And I understand he tends to be conservative on these matters. And if we're not ready to look into everybody's bits at pretty much any time, then we are, I think, consigned to an open internet, and one that unless we apply and size the endpoint, much any of us will be able to indulge our curiosities on any number of subjects, many of which third parties will say, you shouldn't be looking at gambling, at terrorist information, at, you know, fill in blank. And I just wonder how much that really reflects where we're prepared to stand. I guess it gets back to the uncertainties when I tried to put a question out as to whether we would support, in essence, a bill of rights for internet users that say you have a right to unfettered access, probably clouded, as was pointed out in one of the breakout sessions, by caveats that uh, are unclear, but basically willing to say we support that right, even though we know it will, in fact, carry costs. People will be hurt because of it. Whereas sexism, racism, etc., are included. So in trying to create a clean internet for children, we might end up um, creating some kind of, I don't know, ideological monster in which maybe sex is, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a very easy issue to, to kind of throw away, but right. other very problematic issues would stay. And it's a way, it's even, in a way, it's even more dangerous than being aware of the internet as it is today, because this, you know, illusion yeah. of cleanness and safeness might be very dangerous. So even the first word which is supposed to be Right. Is problematic. I guess, if, I can Go ahead. Agree, yeah. if we think of the zones literally as, hey, this is a zone for kids, this isn't, objectively speaking, this is the kids' zone, it runs into exactly the problem you talk about, and it parallels somewhat, even though it's actually worse as a problem, the problem categorizing what's spam and what isn't, even though many of us would agree that particular things are spam. Some of the promising avenues 
that I think are actually emerging from the collective wisdom of the internet at large, rather than necessarily from politics or academia or other cathedral-like places, say, well, what you could do actually are have parents who can discover each other as like-minded, so different communities of parents grouped according to their own uh, hot buttons, and then actual way of saying, by the way, my kid saw this site and I was mortified that the kid saw it. And by indicating that judgment, other parents can say, I want to know, I want to have blocked from my child sites that parents like me were mortified by, and I'm prepared to review 40 sites to get things going. If this is the amount of energy we're prepared to put into a music <coughs> recommendation engine, surely a parent would be willing to put it in to say, create a sandbox tailored to my kid. And as long as it's a zone that at some point the kid will outgrow, maybe that's not such a bad click. Yes. I don't have any real problems with voluntary. Do you want to give your name, oh, please, in the well, yes. I'm Barbara Simons. Um, I'm actually retired from IBM Research. Uh, so um, I don't. I don't want to. Uh, I mean, I'd say I don't have any personal problems with uh, fil with filtering systems that people put together on their own, that sort of thing. Uh, but I do want to raise another issue, which we haven't really discussed here, which has to do with whenever you try to impose, impose some kind of filters on the internet, some something to protect children. And that is, in the United States, there's a high, and I, I would guess in the UK, but I don't know, there's a high incidence of suicide among gay teenagers. Um, and there are real problems with young gay people trying to understand their sexual identity, who feel very, who frequently are, are persecuted in school, um, and, and who don't quite know where they belong in the world. Now, people who are going to um, censor the internet in a variety of ways because of sexual content. Uh, who makes that decision? There are certainly parts of the United States where material relating to gay people, to AIDS and so on, would definitely be censored. I mean, there's no question. Now, what standard should we be using? Is that an acceptable standard? And what are the implications? How does that impact these, these kids who probably desperately need some of the information that's available on these websites? Uh, second row, yes. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, 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 Sorry. Whether we expect the internet to be um, pretty much like the offline world, but let's try and limit some of the problems, or didn't we think in those early debates that the internet could actually be better? And one of the things that I, I, I think Stephen Coleman spends his time thinking about is how the internet could actually help to revitalize a kind of an apathetic generation politically. One of the things that people concerned with children think about is wasn't the internet going to be a place where they could escape the already constrained, highly branded, highly commercialized cults that they live in offline, and exactly have sites where they could come out in a, in a, you know, a public sector space, whatever, or spaces where they would not be um, similarly walled, similarly restricted, similarly hemmed in by um, all that kind of danger that they face in the outside world, in the corporate world. We thought the internet could be better. So what I hear is an oscillation between saying, what are we going to do with the fact that the offline problems just continue online? And can we apply some of that offline regulation online? And are we going to give up on that hope that it, we thought it could actually um, overcome some of those problems rather than just be yet another you know, walled, branded environment that children already live in? And I don't think we're that confident it's a good place for them offline, let alone online. Uh, Lily Andrews, University of Edinburgh. I actually wanted to take up Jonathan's point, but I think I'll take up Sunday's first. <laughs> um, in that, one of my hobby horses has been that, yes, there is an obsession with pornography and to a lesser extent an obsession with, with religious hatred, hate speech, etc. There's very little obsession with rating for quality. The major problem with the internet nowadays, we've seen it with spam, we've slightly overcome it with spam filters, is information overload. If we could have the collaborative Wikipedia type collective effort that Jonathan was just talking about, of, of a decentralized effort to rate for quality, the usefulness of information, I think this would actually, this is a very controversial thing to say, this would actually substantially increase the welfare to children rather more so than perhaps pulling those 
resources into wiping out child porn. Uh, I can't believe I said that. Please don't remind me. But I also wanted, you know, quaking in my shoes, actually, to take up Jonathan on the idea that P2P is the ultimate bomb that destroys any chance of national repatriation of the net, national regulation of the net for content. Um, because, yes, there is, there is indeed evidence-based stuff on this, that most pornography is now being passed around and wares uh, via dark nets. This is well known. It used to be used net groups. It's now mutated to, to dark nets. But we've also seen a paper in one of the breakout sessions here in which somebody was demonstrating that there were emerging technologies for packets, <coughs> for spam packets, for malware, for viruses, and conceivably, though they emphasised that's not what they were working on, um, on P2P, um, encrypted, uh, P2P copyright breaching material. It seems to me if they follow that line, it will not be conceivably that long before they can sniff for other types of content that national governments would want to exclude. Well, just briefly, uh, I think that's why it ultimately puts to us the question, are we ready to suborn a network mm -hmm. where you can't peer into the packet? Absolutely. And people can invent around that mm -hmm. ways to encrypt the packet so that somebody in the middle can't see it. And at that point, you're stuck. I mean, well, it's an arms race, isn't it? Yeah. We don't know if they're stuck. We think they're stuck. But in the same way that you said the current debate was so 2003, right. I think the assumption that P2P is the end of all t national tech to regulate is so late 2005. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have the 2007 debate now. And get it over. <laughs> it's also why, for the kids' safe zone, even that has a natural breaking away point where probably at around the age a kid might be thinking seriously about his or her sexuality, that kid is already at the age where he or she can discover VPN and escape the sandbox. And one has to wonder, at the point where the kid is smart enough to know how to get around the block, is the kid smart enough not to be as harmed by the content that might be found outside it? Well, this is the concept of the emerging mature minor that I mentioned in the previous time. Right. Yeah. Barbara? Barbara Simons, uh, the, the encryption was just mentioned, and I, I know a number of us have been worried that there will be efforts made to, in fact, I think there has been already, at least in the United States, to make encryption illegal, or at least to make it sort of like, use encryption in a crime, go to jail for a lot, like use a gun kind of model. And, um, and there are a lot of ramifications to this. There are a lot of ramifications to trying to introduce regimes which are going to filter uh, P2P or anything else that you want. Because once you create this structure, they can read what they can check what people are writing and read it and decide if it's okay or not. And I think this might be a case where, where people from the United States and people in Europe have differing views. Uh, at least for me, and given the administration that we have in power right now in the United States, it makes me very nervous because I frankly don't trust them not to use these powers to check on political opponents. And once you put the structure in place, even if it's for the best of intentions, you then have, don't have control over how it's going to be used. And uh, Europe, people in Europe may completely trust their governments and feel this will never happen, although I know there have been this, this situations in the past where bad things have happened in Europe with governments. But you might feel that will never happen again. I don't feel that kind of comfort in the United States. Yes, I would say, um, I had a wonderful professor some years ago, Harvey Brooks, uh, who and a number of us were talking about trying to get new legislation in place, was saying, always keep in mind, how would the people with whom you disagree use this legislation? And I think, again, that's something we have to think about in all of the things we're so eager to put into place to do good, and some of the unintended consequences that have come or some of our best intentions in that way. Yes, Bill. Just to, uh, I, I really, I think the, the emerging threat, and this came out in a number of things, Sonia's as well as other papers, that it's not just government surveillance and government citizen relations. It's, I think the new technology is enabling citizen surveillance of citizens, and, and it's <laughs> uh, children, children sending photographs of somebody from their gym class to, to other kids and so forth. So it's, it's a. Uh, a surveillance society or a transparent society that's really creating a, a whole new set of, and they, and they, I mean, they were all, that was part of 1984 as well. I mean, surveillance of your neighbors and so forth, but I think that's, and, but I think also we can have, somehow this debate is gonna go nowhere if we, if we use two general terms about Americans or Europeans or uh, governments and, I mean, it's specific 
kids tend to, I mean, you know, young, young boys tend to look for pornography on the internet and uh, there, there, there are particular, we can get more precise. We actually have research about who tends to do what and, but I, and I think that can be more directed in, t in terms of having a global solution. You can, if you know who, who is at risk uh, for particular issues, we can address those problems in a somewhat piecemeal way, but, but one by one. That's how rail safety is dealt with. You know, if there's an accident, you figure out what happened, what, what, you, need, what you need to do to address that, but I think a global solution of the internet's got to be completely different. Or, I mean, you can actually try to address particular problems and over time maybe deal with many of them. Um, but I, the question I have for people, and Malcolm and I are talking about this at break, what level of risk are we willing to live with? What's the, I mean, even in rail safety or anything else, there's a certain number of accidents that are expected to happen. I mean, I, I risk my life every day riding a bike in Oxford, I think. But I think it's, okay, I, I, I know there's a risk in riding a bike or letting my children ride a bike to school or walking to school. And I, and what level of risk are we willing to accept on the internet? Uh, could I uh, you name, sorry, put it like uh, you're in, uh, respond to that as the question of how much choice do we actually have, will we actually have? Because Richard made the point of the glowing, growing nationalization of the internet. And I've now, over the past fortnight, had two discussions with major global corporations, one of which already has a seamless global network running out of five centers, but runs national filtering and national services according to the different rules for Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Dubai, Hong Kong, China, etc. The other one is assuming that that is going to be the case and it needs to prepare for it and is going out to be equipped to do that and is looking for the suppliers who will actually provide that. So when major corporations are assuming that there will be national internet rules with which their corporate networks must abide, although they want an international framework, and in parallel, they would love to have some free open services so that their national customers can behave, we're moving into a multi-speed, multi-tier world, and that situation where the internet is always being rewritten and evolving, that we are going to have that kind of multi-stream world where there will hopefully still be an open internet, but in parallel with national internets, and most of the paying customers will probably want to go in their national internet with their local regulators looking after their safety in accordance with the headlines on the sun call, or the local equivalent calling that something must be done, this is something, therefore it is done. If I can ask a question uh, about that, because it seems to be an assumption as we talk that the technology is a given. And uh, recently, I spent a few days with sort of the, the cutting edge of bloggers and the cutting edge of newspaper owners who didn't want to accept the cutting edge of bloggers. <laughs> and as I was listening, I had the sense of, <coughs> as we were all being so cutting edge, these people had kids at home who were in the proverbial garage. And one says to the other, uh, where's your father? Oh, he's at this really hot shot meeting on blogging. And the other kid says, that's so yesterday. <laughs> and my feeling is that right. we haven't really been pushing on the boundaries, or lack of boundaries, on this technology. And is there something else coming down the pike uh, where we should have a 15-year-old kid talking to us today that say, these are concerns, yes, but did you know what's happening out there and that we should be, in a way, incorporating into our thinking 
the notion that this isn't just a given, but there are, as much as the internet came on and took a lot of people by surprise, certainly not the people who've been working on it or thinking about it at IBM, but there are other things afoot that have to be incorporated into this already complex equation to make us ready to deal with some of these questions, which may even not be solvable in any way with new kinds of technology coming on board. Yes. Which um, from the Oxford Internet Institute. I mean, I agree that there always will be something coming along, and mobiles, in a sense, have intruded because mobiles are almost universally owned by the group for whom we're most concerned at the moment. Obviously, younger people <coughs> have that universal ownership, and they develop the cameras and things without a, you know anyone really thinking it through. But, uh, I think it comes back to Bill's point about risk which I think is the critical point. When uh, we talk about e-democracy with Stephen, you start an e-democracy debate and you very quickly drop the E and start talking about the principles of democracy, uh, uh, direct versus indirect representative democracy and so on. And the same with the cyber safety. I think you, you can sort of drop the cyber and recognize from political terms it's a safety debate. And the question is exactly how much risk will you tolerate? So the politicians are debating, or have been debating recently, whether to ban unpasteurized milk. Uh, and what they're weighing up is the freedom of some people to drink unpasteurized milk versus the possible risk that unpasteurized milk causes to, causes to a small number of people who get diseases from it and may pass it on to other people. It's exactly in those terms that we will talk about the internet. That, uh, um, I think the risk is sometimes we look for 100% solutions, when in fact we should be saying, what's the threshold? And to me, I, I'm a liberal. I want a liberalized internet. I want it open. But to me, the only way to preserve that openness is to deal with the grossest abuses. If you deal with the gross abuses, uh, the politicians of the community are happy uh, and are prepared to accept a level of risk. Um, but the political climate at the moment, it tends to be towards total elimination of risk. Um, Unpasteurised milk, vaccination of children, dealing with terrorism. The trend is towards total elimination of risk. And that's where I think the threat, if you like, to the internet comes from. Uh, and we need to offer them a good enough solution, offer regulators a good enough solution that deals with gross abuses <coughs> so that they'll accept a, a level of risk and openness uh, that we would feel comfortable with. Yes. Um, Claire Bell for our NetSafe New Zealand. I'm really interested in that last comment about the amount of risk or the level of risk that adults will accept because talking on behalf of the children and young people who are the main part of my job, the level of risk that they will accept is extraordinarily high. Mm -hmm. Dealing anecdotally with the kind of cyber text bullying calls that come in the schools coming to help over this, and I'm just directly from the kids themselves, is they will accept anything to maintain the links the social links with the have with those, with those um, mobile phones. Mm -hmm. To the point of being literally stalked, death threats from adults who they've met in text chat rooms and so on, um, because they cannot, they will not tell people about it, get help in general because they fear they'll lose it. And that's the reason I'm good. <coughs> I've got to go to maintain that link. And I think we need to understand that children's level of, of their acceptance is quite mind-boggling from an adult point of view. We must, I think, pack this in when we talk about what we as adults were accepted for. Yes. Now, there were, excuse me, it's the gentleman behind you. Uh, Derek Fuhlinger, consultant in the Middle East, and especially in the Gulf region. Um, I want to ask a question to the, to the panel. There is in Dubai a computer and communication university, technical high school. Now, um, my question is, um, it's fair already some cooperation with this university, because in my opinion, this can be, and one should be aware and alert, this can be a ticking bomb from the intellectual point of view. Yeah? Because this university is not only open for the Agar world, it is open for the entire Islamic world. And people are fair, get educated. It can be a source for the Al Qaeda. Yeah. So if one would take them in to cooperate with them, to take them on such occasions to a conference, um, one, one should have at least some, I wouldn't say controlling function, but one, one, one should at least know what they are doing. Um, I was just ruminating on this question of 
what acceptable risk. And it seems to me that there's almost two kinds of people we're concerned about here. There are the regular abusers of the internet, for lack of a better word, and then there are the really serious, hardcore people that arguably are the greatest threat to society. And I suspect that those people are already using technologies that are not capable of the kinds of responses that we're uh, in a position to implement. Um, you're talking about uh, encrypted peer-to-peer -peer networks and terrorists using you know, the layer six of the internet or protocols that, that, are, that transcend even the capacity of packets, for instance. And I mean, Peter Grabowski might have something to say about this as well, but um, my thought is that um, you know, in our attempts to try and um, create a safe environment, we're actually addressing um, you know, as much of the mass problem as we can, but we're actually um, missing the real areas where the greatest danger is potentially occurring. <coughs> and I just don't even know how. In Australia, we're having a debate, for instance, over voice over IP and things like Skype, where you've got um, uh, telephonic uh, voice communications over the internet protocol. Um, which are encrypted in some cases and totally uh, escape any capacity of the existing interception regulations to manage. And uh, I think that when we're talking about evolving threats, this question of um, you know, how you address that is just, uh, we're already, that, that's a very 2007 kind of uh, discussion that we ought to be having now. I'm sure if somebody has a handle on that, they're not saying. <coughs> Those who don't know speak about those things, so I, would, I would have a clue. I mean, what do you do, for instance, about a pedophile network that's operating in an encrypted peer to peer environment? <coughs> you go into their houses. Seriously. You need the intelligence to go into their houses. You have your hand up, of course. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's a, it's a more general question. Say your name again for uh, the Lillian Edwards, Edwards. 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 I, I find it very difficult to say what kind of level of risk we'll expect. If, if we take Richard's pasteurised milk, for example, the risks of pasteurised, unpasteurised milk have been constant for centuries, surely. They don't change. Yeah. So, so we can make an assessment at any point of our societal history as to whether we're willing to take that risk or not balance it against personal liberty and autonomy. But you can't do that with technology. If you go back to the car analogy, at one point we weren't willing to accept the risk of having a car go above, what was it, three miles an hour, without having a man with a red flag walking in front of it, you know, to protect the, the people and the horses in the street. Nowadays, we're willing to accept the risk of having cars traveling at, say, 50 miles an hour in urban zones, because A, the technology has changed, so they brake faster and things like that, and B, our social norms have changed, so that people know not to wonder, you know, how it's general carriageway. So it, it, isn't, it isn't a static factor in the equation, so I find it a really difficult question to answer. Yes? Malcolm Pelcher from the AOI. Just on the whole point, that there is a whole world of research and understanding and risk management and risk, more importantly, risk perception. And they, they derive from studies initially in the kind of nuclear industry and scientists coming up with, with rational, all these charts of the back to Mark Twain, you know, why worry about nuclear when you, you're more likely to have an accident at home. But that then moved on to people saying initially the scientists said, oh, the stupid public don't understand it. But risk perception studies have discovered certain characteristics of why things that people regard as high risk, whether you're in control of it or not. And it seems if the dog that didn't bark, I, I, I would have liked to have more in-depth understanding of precisely and drawing on the expertise there is, because a, lo a lot of it seems to relate to that. But there, there are ways of finding out those answers, and there are already some answers. Anybody? Oh, yes, go ahead. Why don't you have the last word? Oh. Because I think uh, we can, I'd like the panel, really, each to say afterwards what he and she thinks are the major points that we should take away from this panel, the summary of the summary. I just wanted to respond to your point about uh, the Middle East, and, uh, and I think you know clearly the, the OII and 
Uh, certainly, me personally. I, I mean, it, it's the, um, we definitely believe that uh, there should be an international communication about this. I mean, we took our summer doctoral program to Beijing. A lot of people criticized us, saying, how could you go to Beijing? <laughs> go to China, and uh, but the, you know, we think it's absolutely important that we uh, communicate internationally. <coughs> we had a whole group of princesses from Saudi Arabia come through the OII to talk to them about what they can do on the internet, et cetera, and how they should be educating their own public about this. So we're that's one of our agenda items, and in the, certainly this conference, we, we tried to make it as international as we could, but it's obvious that there are major limits. But I think this conversation <coughs> has to go on much more globally. If you each like to do one or two sentences of the summary of summaries, I think that will help us move into... That could be mine. Yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> right. Well, I'll follow up. Uh, actually, um, one of the gentlemen that Bill just made, um, I do think that if we continue on in, in this format again, perhaps in two years or whenever, um, and certainly there are a number of events where we can all convene and for the time that um, there is a broader voice. This has certainly been a, a very sort of Western focused uh, mm -hmm. discussion. And particularly on the issues of privacy, uh, coming from a country with a strong indigenous population, I think it's very interesting to have that perspective in debates about privacy. Um, but I don't say that that's, uh, I don't see that there's anything lacking from this uh, occasion. I think this is the start of something that will hopefully continue. Thank you. Peter? Yeah. Uh, I think in terms of commercial solutions and, and market forces, uh, not as a panacea, not as a solution to everybody's problems, but as uh, uh, a array of, of light, uh, think about emerging public demand for products less vulnerable to criminal exploitation. Um, uh, I think I think there's a potential great payoff there. Mm -hmm. um, I never thought I'd ever seem to be quoting Donald Rumsfeld. Oh. <laughs> 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 but he said this very zen thing. <laughs> he said that there are there are things you know, and there are things that you don't know. And of the things that you don't know, there are the things that you know you don't know, and there are the things that you don't know you don't know. So I think that um, you know, my sense from this is that we're not quite sure where we need to go with this, but we know that we're not there yet. And I guess we just don't want to stop trying. Thank you. Uh, it seems to me, as I say, as an outsider, that this has just opened up so much. For example, we really don't understand enough about the psychology of children. And I think some of the questions that have been brought up about what can children tolerate and still move into adulthood as fairly normal, whatever that means, people, uh, has yet to be answered. I mean, I guess, as I heard people talking, I was thinking, of Cole Porter's song that begins in olden days, a glimpse of ankle was shocking, but now anything goes, heaven knows anything goes. Well, where that ankle was just as shocking to a generation in the 19th century, and we don't really understand what is it that the human being can incorporate and what is the role of the society in changing of bringing those values to bear that have to be eternal. And I guess what I've found <coughs> here is the centrality of children, that of all the concerns that people have mentioned, whether they've described the concerns about children as violence or pornography, that that is the one variable which everybody seems to agree on uh, is the one that drives our concerns about the future and this technology. Uh, let me just end, if I may, before Vicki takes over and gives us some observations of her own uh, about really how wonderful it's been that the group from New Zealand and Australia, which for some of us is just as exotic as Saudi Arabia, <laughs> have brought their perspective to bear and have pushed us to think about some of these issues in a very different context. 
the other thing, again, I think maybe some of you who are visiting are not aware of, is how radical the Oxford Internet Institute is at Oxford. I mean, this is a place which has had such a cloistered existence that they were able to turn around and say this is the future. Uh, it's only in recent years that Oxford faculty have really begun to have relationships with government, for example, where they've taken the train down to advise parliament. So it's, this is really a radical experiment, and as you can see what Bill has done here, it's beginning to change the way people here are thinking about new technology and how it impacts the structures of the university and of the larger world. And if I may be allowed one orthogonal tale, uh, I was speaking to an Oxford alumnus recently, an 86-year-old civil servant, now emeritus, who's still writing a lot, Brian Burkbart, and he was an alumnus of Christ Church. And he said in the 40s, he was in the army in North Africa when he got a letter and opened the letter, and it's from the steward of Christ Church, and it said, Dear alumnus, sadly, I have observed that the 1923 and the 1924 clarets are beginning to turn. I <laughs> urge you to return to dine at all as frequently as possible so that we do not lose these clarets. <laughs> now, this was at the height of World War II. <laughs> this man is fighting in North Africa, and he's faced with the dilemma, does he talk to his colonel about letting him go so he can come back to Oxford and bring the clarets? And it gave me such a sense of how Oxford existed in this cocoon. And the steward here, by the way, is a professor, so it's not as if he was only an urnologist. So I think that we have to keep in mind again the rapidity of the change that this institute has brought about to Oxford and the opportunities it's going to provide all of us to bring to bear aspects of these issues which are individual to us. As I say, I heard these issues more sociologically, more social psychologically, and began to think about technology as many people here who are lawyers, uh, who are constitutionalists, gave it a totally different context. So I'd like to thank those of you from New Zealand and Australia who really provided the go for this, and Bill to say this is exactly what we should be doing, and Vicki, if you would like to take over and add the final comments on this, it's just great. I have to say, Dorothy, you're such a ruthless chair, you've actually got your own back and you've reduced my session to five minutes as well, so. <laughs> <laughs> now I know how you all felt, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay, I'm going to let people go at one o'clock. Um, oh gosh, how am I going to do this? So many, so many things really that I wanted to sort of pull out of what we discussed over the last two and a half days, and I think really you are now going to have to wait and see what we produce, perhaps that's the best way of doing this. Um, I suppose, in a way, the two things, though, that I'm most reassured by is that we did get out of this conference what I wanted to get out of it. First of all, it's become clearer to me, um, perhaps I'd even expected it to, that it was worthwhile looking at both the issues of security and safety together. Um, I think the reason they fit so well together has been made much clearer over the last few days. I mean, the first thing is that whilst we see the Internet as, as not being separate from ordinary, everyday life in a physical world, it does seem clear that it does pose new challenges and new risks, both in terms of security, um, hacking, denial of service, spam, etc., and in terms of child um, or even vulnerable. I don't think it should just be children. I don't think it should just be pornography, but it's about vulnerable users and ty different types of content, and not even just types of content, things like gaming. So it's also about interactivity, um, uh, sort of length of exposure, intensity of experience, and so on. So that's the first thing: is it does seem to display um, possibly some new risks and some new challenges. Secondly, I think there's a similarity in the sense that both seem to require, uh, sorry, both issues of security and safety and dealing with those seem to require some level of sophistication from users that we don't currently see. I mean, it's been referred to again and again, if you like, that, um, you know, whether it's installing something simple like antivirus software or even knowing what your children are doing on a computer, um, that these are uh, requirements which we don't currently see from, from ordinary everyday users to the level that we would hope to see. 
I think additionally, um, there have been questions raised in both cases about this issue of risk management, how much risk is acceptable, what is involved in making that judgment, and importantly, who should be judging the appropriate level of risk. And also, I think there was an issue about um, the different types of approach that you can take in dealing with these issues, whether, again, of safety or security, which refer to things like agency versus enforcing trust, um, empowering a user for, against taking away that responsibility from the user, um, decentralizing the way the internet is used mm -hmm. and using that as a form of securing sync versus centralizing it and ensuring that all decisions about safety and security are taken either by industry or government. So I think those are the commonalities between the two issues which have come out very strongly for me and I think reassure me that it was worth looking at the two together. Um, in terms of the general lessons that, that I think we can learn, and, and sort of, I like Ian Walden's reasons to be cheerful, number one, partly because I like Elvis Costello, but, but also because I think it's a useful framework to think about this. I mean, the first is that whilst I'm saying that the cyber world does create perhaps new risks, we've also heard that it's not a separate world, and that that should reassure us that existing agencies, existing infrastructures, existing in expertise can be brought to bear on some of these problems. And it's really just a matter of finding out how to draw on those existing practices and expertise and to change them where necessary. I like Jim Gamble's presentation because it precisely showed how you could have institutional inertia, institutional ways of doing things, ways of acting, but change them, but apply your old skills in a new way. And I think that's an important lesson. Secondly, perhaps that um, we don't need perfect solutions. I mean, this has come up again and again, actually, in this final panel, that, that small steps are okay. I was grateful, actually, that Barbara did remind us that actually filtering is never going to be 100% effective. It cannot be, given the nature of what we want it to do. But to me, actually, you know, that doesn't mean that we don't use it. I think it's this question of finding out what level of risk you want and then developing a range of tools to minimize the risk to the level that you're happy with and, and the, uh, accepting that no one solution is perfect. And again, Andreas Bush, I think, raised a useful point there to suggest that we shouldn't be looking for international, coherent, consistent uh, solutions, which are the same everywhere in the world, but accepting that we might need to deal with these on a, um, a sort of more, um, a, a sort of a bit at a time, deal with a particular issue, find a particular solution for that, rather than sort of looking to solve everything all at once. And finally, I suppose that it's um, a plea that came from both Sonia and Elizabeth France that one of the things that we can do to help us deal with these issues more effectively is to learn more about how users use the technology, which again is partly where research comes in, but I think also this is where that we need partnerships with NGOs and with industry. <laughs> Um, who have a lot to offer. So those are the things that I'm drawing from this conference. Um, as I said before, we do want to produce something short, policy report, uh, after the event. I'm going to figure out a way. I'm just going to put my email address up on this board um, so that while you're packing up, if you want to send me anything next week, please do so. Um, I'd be very gratefully received, but I'll also make sure that we send out details of anything that we produce for comment um, and make it clear as well when materials are going on our website. So. That's all I wanted to say. Um, I would also just like to thank you all very much for coming to this event. Um, you know, I've enjoyed it so much. <laughs> you know, you forget about this when you're organizing a conference and you're stressed. You forget that you're going to actually enjoy it, and I have loved every minute. So I'd like to thank you very much for coming. I'd like to thank all our excellent speakers, just who, you know, have constantly surprised me both with the sort of high-level content they're producing and also the, you know, sort of way it's been delivered. And, of course, also, finally, the OII staff. Our IT guys, I think, have been forgotten sometimes when we thank them, but they've done a great job, um, as well as the event staff outside. So thank you very much for coming, and I hope we'll all stay in touch. <laughs>